We have uh, Rick North over here on my far right. He's with Clean Water Port Portland. Portland. Mm -hmm. And also Kelly Barnes, also with Clean Water Portland. That was the group that was involved with the uh, with the rally today. Although I think there was a smattering of Occupy Portland as well. <laughs> they were the most vocal, I think. It seems like Occupy Portland is more involved in, in uh, well, I don't know about scientific, but uh, trying to be a little bit more uh, sedate. I don't recall seeing uh, Clean Water Portland out there shaking their fists and things, but maybe after fighting this battle for so long, you might feel like doing so. <laughs> this battle has been going on for some time, and I, I'll just open up. Somebody mentioned, I think actually in the video, that uh, this had been passed in the 80s, and then it was rescinded. Was that by a vote of the people? Do you know anything about that? Uh, Either one I of you? I believe it was passed in 1978. Maybe that and was it. Then, but it wasn't put into effect. And then 1980, it was taken oh. back again. This is before my time here. Oh, uh, okay. But I think that. I think that's what happened. I was curious so about it was, that. 1980, I think, was the last vote on this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I don't. You were down there. I don't. I don't remember seeing you. But if you were down there and today, I, today you weren't. I there. was actually working with clients today. That's right. You I was at there. testimony last week. Uh -huh. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So some oh, people have to work. Others uh, are retired. Yeah. You know. So <laughs> yeah, you're uh, retired. Uh, so what? What was your feelings about that today? Today? Yeah. Well, it was not unexpected. Uh, right. It we, still hurt though. It always hurts, uh, you know, and to hear these things being said and to think, you know, it was like, did anything we say make a difference? Uh, and did it listen? didn't seem to. It was almost as if anything that went against this prevailing attitude that, you know, they have two basic precepts here that they go by. One is that... You know, and we're all on the same page. Nobody wants kids to have cavities or adults, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So we're all we all want the same thing. But what they're saying, and their basic precept is that you can do this. You can put this drug into the water supply, and it it you know to reduce cavities, and then it won't have any effect on anybody else. And just on the surface, that that's crazy. Mm -hmm. No, I mean a drug for the entire population that won't have any side effects on it you know that's that's their concept that, you know it's perfectly safe for everybody nobody is more sensitive than anybody else exactly yeah. you know and and then the second uh you know the second foundation they have is that there is this consensus of virtually everybody that believes that uh you know that this is safe and that is simply not true especially worldwide oh especially worldwide i mean you've got 196 countries in the world, 27 of them fluoridate, and out of those, 11 fluoridate for more than half of their population. Most of the countries of the world have just said, no thank you. Europe, 97, 98% of the, of the people in Europe drink unfluoridated water. There's about 48 countries in Europe, five fluoridate. That's it. Mm -hmm. And you should see some of the statements if you go on the Fluoride Action uh, uh, Network's uh, website. They got a great website. That's fluoride, fluoridealert.org. Fluoridealert.org. Thank you. And uh, you know, and you see these statements like the French official. Uh, uh, you know, it's just like, well, we don't do this basically for medical and ethical reasons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, to mass medicate an entire population, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and. I think an important component to that when considering an additive to water, this is a medical additive. And we would expect any due diligence for any medication put in our water outside of simply talking about fluoride. Just like we expect for any drug put on the market, you know, the pharmaceutical companies have to show safety and effectiveness. And for this particular purpose, the, the elements added, the compounds, the chemical compounds, hydrofluorosicilic acid, has never been shown to be safe and effective by the manufacturers that produce it. Especially taken internally rather than topically. Absolutely, and that's a great point because the CDC, while it does say, you know, we, we believe that fluoridation is very positive for our communities and our nation. It's one of the top 10 best things we've done in the 20th century. They say in the same breath, however, we believe that the effect is post-eruptive, meaning, you know, place it topically, don't swallow it. It's essentially the benefit of the fluoride. Mm -hmm. Don't swallow it like the, like the little thing on your toothpaste. Don't swallow right. it. Right. It does say that on toothpaste. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is interesting to bring also up in conjunction with that point, you know, we're in a non-fluoridated community. And the American Dental Association and 
the American Academy of Pediatrics have said to the members in those associations in non-fluoridated communities where they recommend supplementation, going back as far as 20 years ago, to reconsider the dose of supplements being recommended. So what that translates to in water is for a child who is three to six years old, two cups of water. For a child who is under the age of three, one cup of water. For an infant, none, and for formula, none. So when you take that recommendation of supplements that many physicians prescribe because Portland is currently not fluoridated, it does you know, take one to take pause about total exposure and total fluoride intake. Well, I know at, at the rally a couple of weeks ago I went there and there was a sign saying, talking about the water and the beer. And it got me thinking, even though that's kind of a chuckle, uh, any, any product, coffee, anything that's bottled, it's used in Portland water, will, be, will also be uh, having fluoride in it. So the two cups of water you might drink won't be all the fluoride you're getting. Again, another great point. There are studies that look at this specifically, essentially total fluoride exposure, or, or stated otherwise, how do we manage the fluoride we get? How do we look at that as parents with children? I have two children, very different ages, you know, seven years apart. How do I, as a parent, go to the grocery store and know what levels of fluoride we're consuming? Due to labeling laws, that is not you know, easily available to us as consumers. However, there are many studies showing that some of our favorite foods for kids, raisins, for example, have excessively high levels of fluoride. Children aren't washing their raisins or rubbing them off. Things like mechanically debrided chicken, chicken sausage, fish, grape juice, even that from, you know, original juice is shown to be high in pesticide residue. Sodas due to phosphate syrup, not the actual water in the soda, but phosphate syrup. Shredded Wheaties, evaporated water showing high grains, uh, you know, intake of the pesticides on the grains. You name it, when you start measuring these, we're exposed already close to or beyond our optimal levels. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, a fellow on TV, uh, Anderson, uh, Anderson Cooper, a while back, uh, went in and had some testing done. And uh, he was shocked at the amount of chemicals that they found in his body. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, he's probably, you know, he's upper class, he eats well and, he, and all that. And uh, so he's not probably getting much from the environment. But for just everyday people that are eating on a, on a diet that, that uh, may not include a lot of organic foods, what you're saying is very true. I'm never going to eat again. <laughs> but, but You'll Rick, still have the beer, though, won't you? Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> so when you were talking, we mentioned just briefly a few minutes ago other countries. Uh, what I understand is uh, not only have uh, a lot of countries in Europe rejected it, as well as some cities in this country, but a lot of them have just turned around in a back step and stopped doing it. Are you familiar with with any with any of that? Yeah, any yeah. Statistics yeah. There on that? are yeah. There are. Um, what's fascinating? Twice I've heard this argument now. Uh, the the fluoridationists will say, well, you know, Europe doesn't have that many, but you know, they got other factors, you know, and they. One of them was, well, their waterworks aren't the same as here, so they can't set the, set it up mechanically. It's too difficult. <laughs> Well, okay, but what about the six countries in Europe? Uh, I don't remember them all, uh, Germany, Switzerland, I know, I know there were two of them, I think uh, Finland was another, but uh, don't quote me on that, but six of them had been fluoridating. Spain, maybe. Most, most never had. Six of them had. They were already set up to do that, and they've stopped. As the science came in, they've stopped. They're going forward by going in the other direction. I mean, they've got scientific societies over there, medical societies. They're looking at the science, too, and they're coming to a completely different conclusion. And what was interesting, um, well, Sam Adams had in his, um, you know, in a recent uh, Facebook posting, you know, uh, this, this thing about Europe. Well, I said, well, you know, a lot of, well, they've got uh, a lot of fluoridated salt over there. You know, that's another reason. So they don't need, they're getting fluoride from other sources. Well, five out of 48 countries have salt. Okay, <laughs> fluoridated salt. And the big thing is, this is a consumer choice. You go into the grocery store, mm -hmm. you've got fluoridated salt, unfluoridated salt. You make the choice. Public water, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. No choice. And like I think one, first or the second of the people that I interviewed there pretty much said the same thing, that uh, you know, it should be our choice. And uh, I don't understand why city council is taking it upon themselves to force this down our throat, other than the fact of the interviews towards the end that this is, this is uh, you know, uh, 
chummy with the contractors or or however however these back door deals that had been going on for months before the Oregonians sprung the story and, and blew their cover. Yeah, and you know, that's incredibly interesting to me because other communities have come up. For example, West Slope Commissioner was there at the testimony saying, hey, we read about this in the newspaper. You know, why did you not come to us? You know, mm -hmm. other buyers of Portland's water. I believe in the newspaper today, was it Tigard? And yeah, I want to say had an Gresham. article about it. Well, Tiger, Tualatin, Gresham. Gresham. They're not going to pay for it because they haven't I, been consulted. I, I, in the I think process. that's. I think that's Gresham. I, I think Gresham was it's, talking about. Maybe I missed Tiger though. I'm I, pretty I sure it was. Ti I'm, okay. Don't quote me, but I think it was Tiger and Gresham. But the bottom line is, other communities who share our water source have not been consulted. We, the public, have not been consulted. Communities in which we share our water sources with have not been consulted. So the burden of that cost is going to fall on the Portland community. And it's just, it's a bigger discussion than simply not involving the citizens. They haven't involved anybody in due diligence. That's a good point. There was, uh, there was an article in the Tribune about that, and I picked it up. And I haven't read it yet. That uh, They were saying just what you just said there, that uh, they're upset, maybe not necessarily over the fluoride. It's the lack of democracy. Absolutely. A absolutely. This is this has gone from beyond, this. you know, the, the story in the Oregonian that broke was August 10th. Okay. We just had the vote today, September 12th. We're talking about a month. That's it, okay? Mm -hmm. And this had been going on for I don't know how many months and months beforehand. They've been having discussions behind closed doors, you know, about fluoridating Portland's water and didn't tell anybody, you know, not all these cities outlying Portland that are buying their water, not the public, you know, a complete surprise. And, and it would have been later if the Oregonian hadn't broke the story. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is more than about fluoridation. This is about the democratic process. Right, and that's a great point, again, to talk about Clean Water Portland. Obviously, there's going to be a referendum to this ordinance passed today. Yes. So there need to be 20,000 plus signatures gathered in 30 days. The vote itself, I believe, is in May of 2014. If those signatures are gathered, there will be a hold on the process of implementation until the vote occurs. So, you know, this is a call. That's fine. I, I, well, I think. I've been hearing well, differences okay. of opinion this, on this. This can get a little confusing here. Well, that's the referendum, if we get the 20,000. It's you know, Kim's email like uh, uh, five minutes ago. Uh, okay. Uh, as far as I know, okay. well, this could be, this is, okay. the referendum, I think it would be in March of 2013, um, right? Kim, that was going around today. Kim, yeah. however, checked with the city this afternoon to verify this point. Uh -huh. And I just received an email prior to walking on, literally tonight, that indeed it would stop the process, but the vote itself, what I'm told through clarification, would be May of 2014. Okay, Regardless, we need 30 days to gather 2,000 signatures. Clean Water Portland is the organization organizing that campaign. There obviously needs to be fundraising because, quite honestly, the other side has very deep pockets. Look at the coalition that's supporting this proposal, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Kaiser. There's a lot of money coming into that coalition. Agrochemical companies wouldn't surprise me given the source of the fluoride being proposed. So, I, you know, we, the citizens of Portland, we our democracy should be about us as citizens. So we need a call for people to step forward and get signatures and be participating. Right, and I was going to bring that up because I ran across, in fact, you were one of the people I talked to. I ran across uh, different opinions. Of course, there's the, the initiative, which is uh, May of 2014, that people are going to try to get up. And the people are confusing that with the referendum. But at the same right. time, the referendum itself, there's some confusion about. And, of course, uh www.cleanwaterportland uh, will have Absolutely. updates and yeah. will be able to square that away. They will clarify yeah. that. They tomorrow. will clarify yeah. that when they get yeah. that squared away. But I'm kind of wondering, uh, does that is that basically like a, a, a judge putting a hold on a timber sale and nothing can move forward until it's mm -hmm. voted on? That is my understanding. I'm not a legal expert. That's through consultation with a lawyer that we heard communication with. Um, however, I think it's again important to focus on the issues like let's get signatures. We've been shut out of this process and we do have to ask ourselves why. You know, I actually um, was involved with Oregon Citizens Safe Drinking Water many years ago when it was a statewide issue and we did outreach to educate legislators in Salem. At that point in time, we visited Commissioner Leonard and he was against putting this through an ordinance in Portland. So I think we have that to we ask ourselves, why? why? Mm -hmm. Like, why upon leaving is this all of a sudden fast-tracked? And we as citizens, you know, are being shut out of educating ourselves on further issues. The mere fact that the product has no safety and effectiveness data from the manufacturer 
manufacturers causes one to take pause. I as a parent got involved when I was looking at tablets for my son and started studying the actual chemical compounds of fluoride and I decided, hey, like I'm not sure that there's been a safety and effective process. Why do I want to be considering putting this in water for my children? And when you look at the manufacturer's data and when you look at their liability on this issue, they have none. The biggest manufacturer of products is Mosaic, formerly known as Cargill. And yes. That's what that Mosaic meant. Exactly. Okay, they yeah. changed their name, go figure, right? Mm -hmm. And this particular product proposed for water for Portland's water through the Water Bureau of Portland is hydrofluorosilic acid. It is a known chemical compound. It cannot be put in water, lakes, rivers or our air by law, but they can repackage it as an acid and dilute it in our water for the purpose of preventing dental decay, namely under hydrofluorosilic acid. It's concerning to me that my pediatrician did not know this, that our physician did not know this. I simply think we as the public have not been educated. You know, it seems to me that so much of the, of the medical uh, uh, profession gets their cues from the pharmaceutical companies rather than from, from any other source. And it seems to me that it, it doesn't surprise me that they're not kept keeping up on this aspect of what's going on. Yeah, and the other piece to that, we assume, I assumed, I'll consider myself a citizen who was pro-fluoride prior to this education many years ago, that we assume the EPA is monitoring this, that we assume they're looking at our water sources. In fact, they cannot regulate additives. They can only um, regulate contaminants and public health goals of contaminants. So then we imagine, well, I guess the FDA is doing something. You know, the substance of fluoride is considered medical for the purpose of tooth decay. However, the FDA has no jurisdiction over this issue. So then I ask myself, well, if the FDA and the EPA is not involved, who is? And the truth of that, it's a voluntary standard set up by the chemical that, in fact, produces the product. And it, it, states have the ability to participate or not. It's a very complex process. But the bottom line is there's no one looking at safety and effectiveness and whether the product being used is actually intended for the purpose of tooth decay is helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I should read. This is, a, um, this is not the same chemical that they're thinking of fluoridating Portland's water with, which is a liquid. This is a salad that some, um, this is sodium fluorosilicate, which some like smaller cities might use. You see the skull and crossbones here, but I just want to read this part, which gets to Kim's point. Uh, no responsibility can, uh, can be assumed by vendor uh, from, I'll skip some of this, from any hazards inherent in the nature of the product. They're not taking responsibility. They're not mm -hmm. taking liability. Neither is the FDA, neither is the EPA. Nobody is. You know, we're on our own if something goes mm -hmm. wrong. So you think nobody's got safety? And, and you've got to, you have to understand too, there are contaminants in these. Okay. It isn't just it, pure no, fluoride. No, no, no. It's, they've got, they, they do sample testing on these. Okay. And 43% of the samples were showing up uh, for arsenic. 2% were showing up for lead. Now, um, this Everybody is... Everybody knows this, what that means. Well, okay, <laughs> well, here's the thing. So this is, you know, uh, okay. Now, to be fair, okay, the amounts in there are legal, okay? The EPA has set maximum amounts. They, you know, if they're telling the truth, uh, they are below those levels, okay? So, you know, okay, be fair to them on, on that regard. But look at the other side, okay? Arsenic and lead are known carcinogens, okay? There, the EPA has said there is no safe level uh, for these two, uh, these two elements, mm -hmm. okay? They're just dangerous at any level. So we are knowingly adding... Uh, arsenic and lead, no safety, uh, no safety level whatsoever to our water. Now, what the other side will say is, well, you know, it, could, it occurs naturally. It's natural, you know. So well, strict you know, well, you know, I mean, you know, a bear in the woods is natural too, you know, but if it's chasing you through the trees, it's not safe, you know, okay? You slap him on the you nose. Know, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, so it's one thing if it's just in there and you've got to reduce the level, you know, and understand that, you know, uh, to, to be a safe level. But this we're knowingly adding 
you know, two known carcinogens to our water. And the other thing yeah. about that, those uh -huh. those health goals established, there's two levels of goals, and I may not do this justice, but one includes cost and expense to the society when the EPA comes out with goals. The other go goals are considered public health goals. And for public health goals, the levels of lead and arsenic that are recommended are zero, period. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the end of the discussion. So when they debate, oh, it's legal, it's legal, but it's due to other reasons than just looking at public safety. And then again, it isn't something that we're, gra that we're getting from a little bit of a food stuff or whatever. It's something that we're washing down every day with, you know, uh, with with the water we drink. And you know, they say to drink a couple quarts of water a day. And in the, in the maybe the bottled water we drink, it comes from here, or like I said earlier, the beer and mm -hmm. and all these different things that where we we have water. We might be getting fluoride in some of the water that we're we're buying in bottles. And beer that we're buying, and, and the Coca-Cola that we're buying, that's coming from other other cities as well, too. But and here's the thing: like you can talk about fluoride, and yes, you know, I absolutely agree. Total fluoride intake is something we need to discuss. The 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 professionals making these decisions, even the ones that dose sub call so-called optimal levels, it used to be above two, then it was 2.0, and then it was 1.2, and now it's 0.7. Well, there's a reason that those levels of, of optimal level are reducing. And I expect over time, as we look at total fluoride intake, they're going to be reducing even further. And that's important to consider is that, you know, our total fluoride intake and how we measure it is not just about optimal level, it's about intake and how much we're getting in. And how is that determined? Is that determined for a 30-year-old adult or a child? Or it's is it's that based on, my understanding, um, a lifetime consumption prediction. Whatever. So that takes you from when you're 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 a infant. I don't know how it works with breastfeeding, but from say an infant on up, then. Yeah, and that that's my understanding of the data. However, another point that I hear you know supporters talk about that I just think is rhetoric and just drives me somewhat crazy. All this anecdotal fear of you know my hygienist looked in my mouth and knew that I wasn't you know from a certain region. Um, what I would like to suggest around this discussion is that there can be reasons to notice whether or not you are intaking fluoride because of fluorosis, not just because you might have dental decay, but you hear, you read about this in the Oregonian as the reason to fluoridate in Portland, and frankly, the other side is misrepresenting the issue. And I'll, I'll bring that up just in a point of statistical analysis. In the paper, you read about the Oregon decay versus Washington decay. Yeah. That is what the mayors talked about. That's, this that's is a, Portland. That's a biggie, yeah. And if you look at the same data, that same SMILE survey data for 2007, and you extrapolate Portland metro children from that survey, we're actually doing quite well and our dental decay untreated is already meeting public health goals so we have to ask ourselves why are the supporters of fluoride not talking about Portland Metro statistics and not allowing the full picture to be revealed to the community mm hmm well one thing that uh, Dr. Paul Conant was saying last night is he he had a graph up of showing how all these cities that are using using the um, fluoride the, the cavities are going down but then when he put up a, a slide of a bunch of cities that weren't, and they were going down. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. th that's cherry picking, it seems to me. It's terrible. And, and one thing I wanted to mention is I read Nick Fish's thing on Facebook of why he's voting yes. And it was the biggest, lamest thing I've ever heard. He did not address any of the issues that the people have brought forward to him. And he's just basically given the political doublespeak that, that uh, we need to make sure that the Portland children are, are, you know, are as safe and, and cavity-free as they can be. And uh, it didn't even go that deep into the issue. What you know? It's funny when you start looking. Last night, I, I was looking at newspaper articles from around the country. Because, you know, we've had this big push here, you know, and we saw it at the hearing, you know, all of these, you know, poor kids with cavities and you know, terrible looking teeth and like that. And again, we're all on the same page. Nobody wants these kids to have cavities or adults mm -hmm. either. OK, so we're, we're all agreed on that goal. But it isn't the Floridation. You know, you look at <clears throat> I was reading articles from Boston, San Antonio, Cincinnati. Uh, all fluoridated cities and have been typically for uh, you know a decade or more and they were saying the same thing there that you know they were talking about the kids terrible teeth and like that how bad it was you think wait a minute they've been fluoridated for years it really mm -hmm. hasn't done that much typically fluoridation you're talking about six tenths of a cat of a surface of a tooth prevention of cavities 
uh, per kid. So it's a little bit, not much, okay? So a little bit. And then for all that, we're getting all these other problems, you know, that, you know, whether you're talking about real serious concerns with thyroid, with uh, kidneys, um, you know, with uh, bone. bone disease, yeah. with bone disease, with fluorosis, of course, you know, and of course, you know, the one that worried me the most is the IQ. There have been a lot of studies, you know, indicating, you know, the higher the fluoride, the lower the IQ. You know, a lot of them from China, you know, all this from India, Iran, Mexico. Uh, yeah, Mexico. So, right. uh, you know, so I just think, you know, what probably haunts me the most just as a person is that this decision that five people are making uh, could diminish the intelligence of an entire generation of Portland children. You know, there's not 100% proof of that, but there is all this compelling data pointing in that direction. Mm -hmm. And we go by, you know, the precautionary principle, which is simply, you know, something should be have, you know, a reasonable assurance of safety, you know, before you give it out to the public. It's not that you give it out to the public first and then say, you've got to prove 100% that it's harmful. Mm -hmm. The burden of proof is on the supplier of the, of the substance. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the council members did, in my opinion, try to discredit that article, the research, to some de when you were speaking at testimony. And I thought the summary that I read about the implications of the study, the, the, the implication this is... This is for intelligence. Right. The yeah, IQ yeah. studies, the implication is that some of the some of the communities studied had higher levels of fluoride, some up to like 11 parts per, per million, but some were down as low as three. And many of those subsets, and I'm sure you can speak to this more, were actually lower than 11. And if you just look at, you know, control, looking at protecting the entire population, there was some suggesting that toxicologists adjust to that for a safety margin of error. Maybe you can speak to that. Yeah. Without getting too wonkish, uh, you know, typically, you know, uh, three, right around three parts per million. Is what they compare to Chinese cities. We're ready for the phones, Jim. Ready for the phones? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we could open up the phones if yeah. folks want to call in. Comparing two cities, typically, high fluoride, low fluoride. You know, the high fluoride typically, you know, around typically two, three, or four parts per million, up to eleven. That was an outlier, but you know, and you know, with, with Portland's level would be. 0 0.7. So a lot of the people are saying, well, gee, that's a lot higher than what Portland would be fluoridating. So don't worry about it. But standard toxicology says you take that where the, the problems are starting to show up that level and you divide by 10 to take into account individual variations in people. Some are more resistant to toxins than others. Uh, and some simply drink more water. You know, it's just you got to take into account the dose. So if you divide the three or the four or the five, by 10, you get 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, where the loss of IQ is showing up, and that is below the level that Portland wants to flirt it. Mm -hmm. And I noticed in, in the talk last night by Dr. Conant that uh, he was quoting at length. Ah, I think we might have a phone call. Right. Okay. Let's get that first phone call. First caller, you're on the air. First caller can be bumpy Let's here. First, first caller, you're on the air. Can you hear me? Hey, we can hear you. Okay, great. I want to thank you both. Thank you all so much for this program. Um, my major concern with this whole fluoride thing is the way it's being handled. Uh, uh, five, it used to be a vote of the people on whether we get fluoride. Now it's a vote of three, uh, three elected officials. And I'm not sure about Nick Fish, but I, uh, as I understand it, uh, Sam Adams and Randy Leonard are not up for re-election. Um, and so they have absolutely no political stake in this whole thing. No mm, well uh, They can they basically can do whatever they want and uh, not pay any political consequence for it. Um, my question about this whole fluoride thing is: um, I live out here in Gresham, and uh, it's a Portland uh, uh, decision, but uh, where the fluoride is entering the system, uh, it affects us out here too in Gresham. Uh, it's a system-wide uh, uh, inundation of fluoride, and I'm wondering, is there any way a judge can block mm. this and then uh, put it to a vote of the people? Uh, and, and again, I want to thank you so much for this discussion, and I will hang up and listen on the air. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much for the call. It's, it's, it's far, crossed my mind yeah. as well. As far as I know, no, uh, that, uh, that a judge cannot block this, that legally anyway the city can make this decision 
uh, in terms of Gresham, or like where I live close to Tualatin or Tigard or other outlying areas, they have uh, long-term, depending on the contract, contracts with the city of Portland to buy the Bull Run water. Now, the contracts can vary, but really they don't have much of a choice. I mean, I, I've met uh, where several else are times get their water, right? with uh, Lou Ogden, the mayor of Tualatin. He says, we're pretty much locked in. He says, if we get... If we get if we have to leave that contract early, we have to pay a penalty. So uh, I don't know Gresham's situation in particular, but I think it's the same way. And I, I read anyway in the paper that Gresham is, is saying, you know, they don't want to pay for the cost, you know, and say, wait a minute, we didn't, you know, you know, we didn't buy into this by our contract. This is something extra you never talked to us about, and uh, there could be a real problem there. So that in that mm. case, I don't know if a judge would enter in or not. Would it affect computer chips? Because that water has to be completely clean in order to wash computer chips. I don't know. Yeah, I don't That's know the question. answer to that either. Uh, you know. But it's interesting to note that fluoride chemical compounds are used for many things, including cleaning computer chips, ceramics, glass, ah, okay. canning hides, textiles, which isn't necessarily to me as a consumer um, a happy thing to consider because we're told that fluoride is fluoride is fluoride. A mineral in water is naturally occurring. We're just bringing this up to optimal levels. However, it's simply not true. It does all these various things in the industrial world. Um, they're different compounds, but what are we actually taking in? Again, it's hydrofluosilic acid. It's what being proposed in Portland. It is a known toxic chemical. It can't be released in the air. It has arsenic and lead it's being added to bull run water it's just it's a question of you know we as consumers don't know that it's not simply what's in our toothpaste pharmaceutical grade fluoride that is not the case mm -hmm. you know that brings me to around to a question i was wanting to get to was its effects on salmon and it also goes back around to what the caller was calling about uh i don't know if we could sue over the fact that we're putting this in the water but uh, it uh, goes into the water, and from what I remember from the rallies that I attended and, and interviews I did, that it can affect the migratory instincts of salmon. So is, is, is you, Do you know either that one study of you? Well? I don't know that yeah. study that well. I know the Willamette River Keepers is opposed to this, uh, and I do know, like on a national level, the Sierra Club is opposed to yeah. it, but the, the specific studies, I don't. Those uh, studies are actually going to be posted again on Clean Water Portland. I did talk to somebody who's sending some data about that very topic. I don't know the salmon studies that well. However, I do know the parts per million being proposed for Portland do show detriment in salmon population and migration. I am not an expert on their studies, mm -hmm. so I really don't know the details. Um, that was a summary from an environmental group that looks at water and salmon migration. However, I do know also, or at least um, it's been cited, that when you look at water fluoridation, we as humans ingest, take in very little of this. Much of it goes out into our community through washing cars and watering gardens and et cetera. So it does affect the, the, the salmon population, the animals you know, throughout the community. And there are a lot of studies that we don't talk about here that does have adverse effects on the animals and fish at large. Mm -hmm. Might be good to make uh, contact with uh, Columbia River and Tribal Fish Commission, who are really spending a lot of their money and money from the government dealing with the salmon populations. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm idea. sure they might have a stance on this as well. I don't, it's, it's, uh, it's the organization. You no, know, we've had about three and a half weeks under a month to react more or less um, yeah. in a reactionary mode, frankly. It's been hard to educate right. and do public outreach. Those organizations um, are on the list to be in touch with. Oh, I thought yeah. that maybe they got in touch with you, you know, because <laughs> if they're on the ball with this, that's it, an important thing because uh, I don't know. I, Judge Redden just might throw a flag up on this. He's the one that's always telling the to the government and, and the and the different people that are involved in salmon recovery that they're they're not they're, the work isn't acceptable. He's been a bulldog on this, and I don't know if this would, this could be factored into that or not. Well, you can see how it affects a lot of different subpopulations. So we're looking mm -hmm. at dental decay for children, right? That's the argument. Let's apply a medical additive that's never been safe and effective to our water in Portland, even though Portland Metro statistics don't validate the need necessarily. We can always do better, but we can do better through public outreach and topical applications and hygiene and nutrition education. We're again not saying we're against supporting and protecting those in those populations in most need, but you can see how the targeted population of which this ordinance is supposed to be helping doesn't consider any other population. What about those of us with diabetes? What about those of us with thyro thyroid disorders? What about autoimmune disease in general? What about those with multiple chemical sensitivities that are told by their physicians not to bathe or drink 
water with fluoride in it. And I heard Charlie Hale say, I think it was on Carl Wilson the other day, um, you know, his... His, um, basically, I heard Charlie Hale say, well, this is a public health policy. I support it just as I would support, and I'm paraphrasing, vaccine policy. And there's always outliers. You know, so, but that's, that's assuming that those mm-hmm. outliers have the ability to opt out. Mm-hmm. We don't have the ability to opt out here. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very true. That's a good point. Did we get another call there? Oh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, yeah, all right. Uh, did you break your train of thought there? Were no, you, that's okay. It's simply, there? again, it's just a matter of choice and opting out. But really, my point was... Anytime. The, mm-hmm. Is there a call there? Yeah. No. He's got it. Oh, he's got it. I think he's trying to bring it through. All right, we'll get the first caller here. Yeah. Next, second caller, actually. Next caller, you're on the air. Uh, yes. Uh, can you hear me? We hear you. Welcome to the program. Okay, great. Uh, one one aspect, see, I filter all my water anyway, uh, and I have fluoride filters on my water. I, I don't trust anything they put in city water. But one of the things I also do is um, I put a fluoride filter on my shower because your skin is the largest organ in your body and it absorbs everything. That's something that a lot of people don't talk about. And it, 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 you cover your teeth with this stuff, fine, but it also goes down inside your stomach and into your whole system. But you also take showers and bathe in it, and it covers your whole body. I'd like to hear some comments on that, please. Right. Thank, Thank you, you for the call. For yeah, there's, our skin is our largest organ. I, I've been giving statistics showing um, there, there are filters for certain chemical additives. However, fluoride does not get filtered out through... Um, Britanna, Multipure, some of the more common ones. It needs to be reverse osmosis, and even then it's 93.7%, I believe, is the study I've seen. Um, the important thing to know about that is those filters cost about $800 for putting onto our water. And to put it into our bathing system, um, somebody recently sent me a quote from a store, it's six to $8,000. The person on the, on the uh, interview said 3000 but even 3000 is beyond most people's means. Here, here's the thing that gets me. I know we had one person testified at the, um, at the hearing, this multiple chemical sensitivity. Um, she's a doctor herself, okay? She's a clinical uh, child psychologist. And she had like a dental treatment done, fluoride. She got very you know, ill after that, was like, feeling like, very woozy. Like you know, Francis was doing you know, I mean, this was topical. You know, she sees her doctor, and she's had these, you know, and she's just one of those people that is sensitive to chemicals. Doctor said, don't ever take, you know, fluoride again. You know, and obviously this would include fluoridated water. There are a lot of people with these sensitivities, uh, you know, and, you know, and you ask and you say, but, you know, the line of the fluoridationist is, it doesn't hurt anybody. You can't tell. And I said, well, wait a minute. It does hurt people. Mm-hmm. You know, what? Are these people just expendable? You know, like, well, too bad. You know, that's just the way yeah. things go. And yeah, sorry, you have this. Uh, there's, or there's or sac- maybe it's just all in your head or something. And you're just imagining there's sacrifice zones. Uh, you know. I see the light. We got another caller. Uh-huh. Next caller, you're on the air. Yeah, my biggest question is, it's like Mount Tabor, they're going to spend millions of dollars to cover the reservoir to keep little bird poop out, <laughs> and yet we're going to be pouring in chemicals. What's the difference? It's almost like we're doing it twice. I don't get it. I'll take oh. it off the air. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, because this issue has been going on. Like Scott Fernandez has been on the show in the past talking about covering up the the, uh, the reservoirs, talking about how covering them up is going to create, uh, was it ammonia or methane or some some issues. I don't, I'm not a scientist. I don't remember. And then it, that the water's not going to be able to breathe and there's, you know, uh, additives and things that are going to build up in it, yeah. and then we're going to turn around and add something else. So either you have a comment on that. That was a, that was a, a, a good comment. Yeah, they are good comments. I mean, they are um, separate is- separate issues, and um, continue. They're very important comments. I think it's really a comment about cost effectiveness of what we're doing with water in Portland. I can only speak to the issue I research as a parent being concerned about a medical additive in our water. Um, however, looking at the cost effectiveness of a program and looking at other costs that the Portland Water Bureau is already having on its shoulders, it might be really wise to look at cost effective programs that really target a subset of the population, perhaps in Portland in need, but the overall population statistical studies don't even show 
that we need the fluoridation in our water. And I think it's important to come back to that because we can debate science and we can debate effectiveness and we can debate tooth decay and we can debate a lot of things, but we should be comparing apples to apples and allowing our dollars through our taxpayers to be used for the most effective needs in the city. Mm -hmm. I think we have another call. This, this subject usually uh, lights them up. <laughs> so we'll get the next caller on the air. Next caller. we still got 12 minutes, too. Hello? Hello, you're on the air. Uh, my question is, is it possible that the governor might have a say on this based on lending laws for the land? I'll take my answer off the air. I, I don't know the answer to that um, at all. You got me on that one, too. The governor, unfortunately, did come out in favor of this you know he, he said that uh i you know i just gotta believe you know it's, it's not that you know because the fluoridationists often list these big you know groups of organizations like that that are in favor of this and you know i don't you know I believe that you know most of these people are very well intentioned i don't think most of these people are getting paid any He's money many <laughs> under the table or anything like that that they really believe you know this is a good thing to do you know i just can't believe that they've seen you know the science you know the other side they're getting one side of the story i how i got into this because i was like kelly for years oh, you know i, I thought fluoridation was fine. I didn't think that much about it. I, you know, I don't want cavities or anything like that. And then about five years ago, and just my background, I was the former state director of the American Cancer Society. And I worked for the Cancer Society for 21 years. I'd worked with uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility before I retired last year for about seven and a half years. So I'm most of my adult life, I've worked with doctors and scientists. I'm not one. I just work with it. You know, you know, so about five years ago, somebody asked me, you know, would you look, would you just look at the science on this? I said, all right. And, and I did. And I was just completely taken aback. And, and this was like my main, my, my main source here. This was the National Academy's report of 2006, Fluoride in Drinking Water, where they had this blue ribbon panel of scientists. Look at this. And my God, there are red flags popping up all over here, you know, on all these various illnesses, where, you know, serious concerns about kidney patients, mm -hmm. about thyroid patients, possible osteosarcoma, bone cancer in boys, the IQ studies, all this, and I thought, I can't believe this. And since then, I put in hundreds of hours of study, and the more I see, the more I'm concerned. So it's just a real, you know, you just think, have these people looked at the science? Uh, because, you know, it helps to be technical, and I've got a lot of scientists and doctors behind me that can help. But much of this is just in plain English, and you can read it and think, my God, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. yeah. And back to that caller's question about the governor, um, when I read that in the newspaper that he was endorsing fluoride in, you know, Portland, I took pause that the governor would actually really come out on a local issue. It made me wonder why, frankly. Good question. And um, yeah. I don't really hear that anybody's talking about that. Mm -hmm. I think we have another call. Okay, we'll get the next caller. Hello? Hello, ne Hello next caller. You're welcome to the program. Oh, okay. I, I just feel like I'm totally missing the boat here. It, we have fluoridated toothpaste, and we have non-fluoridated toothpaste. It's a choice. Why would we need it in the water? I mean, we've always had, you know, exactly. we've always been able to use uh, fluoride toothpaste. Well, so, uh, do, how do they rationalize that? That's yeah. a good question. Well, uh, you know, I mean, because most of the effect, I mean, this, this is really not controversial here. Most of the effect of fluoride, Thank you. the protective effect, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is topical. No, it's, it's just topical. It's brushing your teeth with, with toothpaste. And uh, this is yeah. stated by the CDC. It's not a bunch of people saying that it's the CDC that actually states. Even they admit it, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so. Um, it's an interesting question, and I think, you know, really people need to look at, you know, the bigger picture. Um, it has been endorsed by organizations for many, for a long time, and typically those sorts of endorsements are passed along. It doesn't, you know, there's credibility issues, frankly, um, but as the new science is showing a reason to take pause, I expect that those organizations will one by one start to, you know, look, have a different perspective over time. At least start looking at it. You know, yeah. I think we got another call. Next caller. Hello, you're on the air. Hi. Hello, you're on the air. 
You have a comment or question? Oh, uh, I'm Eleanor. Hello, Eleanor. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I just tuned in, and I was wondering uh, where we could go to sign that petition. There you go. Great uh, question. Uh, uh, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thanks for that lead-in. Uh. I don't know. Um, I don't know the exact address. It's sixth. South, the, the petition location, the volunteer location. Go to Clean Water. Clean Water. Go to the website. Right. Yeah. Go to the website. Go to cleanwaterportland.org. Um, essentially, there's a volunteer um, place where people can pick up petitions. There will be organizations that are occurring and volunteering sessions, but the best place to go is cleanwaterportland.org. I'm glad she asked that question because it's something we need to talk about. Uh, we've talked about it, but, you know, people tune in late like she just did, and, and uh, they may not understand that uh, there, there is uh, the move to do this to do this referendum, we got 30 days to get. I'd say we should get at least 25,000 if we can. Well, you know, we should get. You have to have about 20,000 valid. Uh, you know, because some of them are always thrown out. What does valid mean? Valid means that they are a resident of Portland. They are uh, registered voters, and that they don't sign twice. <laughs> okay, well, or also more the times. The situation you know. is if you if you've moved. You know. you, yeah, you've got you've to gotta register again. You know, if, if you don't have a current registration, you have to register at your new address. So it's very important. So even though all these outlying cities are affected, like I'm down at Durham by Tiger and Tualatin, you can. I can't sign. No, you've got to be a resident of Portland. Uh, but to volunteer now, say to collect signatures, you don't have to be a resident of Portland. So, you know, anybody can volunteer to do this. Especially people so, from places like Gresham who Well, absolutely. Be we've, this. you know, we've got a dog in this fight. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and what we want to say to people is, you know, regardless of where you are on this issue, uh, just the sense of outrage at how this has happened, you know, one month basically, you know, not letting the public or these outlying cities know what was going on, even though it had been planned for months and months and months. And the lack of public discourse, um, you know, we tried to get the other side to just have a public forum, a public debate, so people could see us there, and you know, on the mm -hmm. same stage at the same time. No, they refused. At the public hearing, uh, the city, uh, the city had the public hearing. They had two hours, two hours of it's like a parade of people pro fluoridation. Mm, I, heard I that. specifically asked Randy Leonard. If we could get equal time on that, uh, on that experts forum, no, okay, no, no. Basically, uh, I called, you know, I called the coalition's website just to get some basic information. Uh, I got an answering machine, just basic statistical information. Twice I left messages, no return. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not seeing any effort at all to have any real public discourse. I mean, we scrambled as best we could. Uh, you know, in this very short period of time. But uh, this is, uh, this again, this is a complete, you know, a mockery of democracy here mm -hmm. in the democratic process. Anybody should be upset at this. And if you want to do something about it, we need your time for gathering signatures. We need your money. Uh, so these are the two things that you can really do to help. Mm -hmm. I think we've got mm -hmm. another call. We'll get the next caller, then that'll be it, because we're running out of time here. Uh, get the last call. Hello, you're on the air. Welcome to the program. Hello. Hello, you're on the air. You have about a minute here. I have a, I have a question, and I'll hang up real quick. Sure. Does anybody know where the source of the fluoridation is coming from? If yes. I'm not mistaken, it's question. coming from China. I'll um, hang up and listen. Thank you. I've heard that, but that's not the truth. I don't know. That actually hasn't been validated. The source of the, the fluoride used in Portland's program is hydrofluorosilic acid. It is a byproduct of the f phosphate fertilizer industry. In particular, they look like they may be getting it from Simplot, um, which is another agrochem company. I did call Simplot to ask for their source of fluoride. They did not return my calls or emails. Um, that's not a big surprise. What a surprise, yeah. Um, yeah. However, again, if you look at Mosaic, formerly Cargill, and look at their disclaimer and liability, they have no responsibility for putting this in our water. Our county commissioners have not done due diligence. It has not been shown to be proven safe or effective. It is a byproduct of the phosphate fertilizer industry. It does have chemicals of lead and arsenic. According to NSF Standard 60, this is all published. We are not making this up. It's, pharma it's not pharmaceutical. It's industrial grade. It's industrial. Right? It is not pharmaceutical grade. It is not sodium fluoride. It is hydro. It's hydrofluosilic acid, otherwise known as fluosilic acid. 
Well, we're down about a little over two minutes, and there's one thing I really wanted to talk about. We're not going to get to it, but we'll just mention it in passing. Uh, our government is not forcing the people to take responsibility for you know their own hygiene. I mean, uh, nutrition and hygiene can take care of almost all of this. It seems to me it does not have to. We do not have to to try to medicate the whole the whole population in order to in order to achieve the results that they're asking. I mean, is, is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. And public yeah. outreach into communities in need um, for education, topical application hygiene, nutrition, a lot of this is related to bacteria and pH, even in the dental literature itself. Um, simply ingesting fluoride for the purpose of preventing tooth decay is not the outreach that we need to be providing. We need mm -hmm. to be providing those in need, um, especially parents who may be single parents or different socioeconomics, we need to provide them with the skills and ability um, to, to have dental access, frankly. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing we didn't, real quick, Babies under a year old should not have fluoridated water at all to drink or mixed into infant formula. They should not have it. It can lead to fluorosis. How many poor people is it, you know, are you going to affect there? They're going to have to buy distilled water or, uh, you know, or extra simply water. Or not even know that. Yeah, or many of them not even going to know it. It could so be mixed into Similac. You know, this is, know. yeah, absolutely. So this is wrong. This and I'd just wrong. like to say to the yeah. citizens, I read something in the newspaper today from Commissioner Letter and implying that we, the citizens of Portland, are too busy with our kids, work, and responsibilities to analyze these tough issues, that he can reach an informed decision for us because we cannot. I simply say that with the evidence mm -hmm. presented today and available at cleanwaterportland.org, that you take the time to educate yourselves. It's not up to us saying this. Yeah. It's not up to Fluoride Action Network. We want you to be educated on this issue and show Randy Leonard that you actually are educated and informed and you don't appreciate a backdoor deal. Yeah. Right, and you can take responsibility for your own, Absolutely. For your own yeah. uh, I don't know, you'd call it hygiene or whatever. We're down to about 30 seconds. Got a 10 second sound bite? It's our water. It's our vote, you know, and folks, we got to do it now. We got to take back our water and take back our democracy. All right, that was probably 10 seconds. <laughs> Good job. Well, thank you both for coming on. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I want the viewers to uh, keep in mind that we're going to be doing this more in the future, all over public access and cable radio. So, um, well, thanks for tuning in. I want to thank the uh, callers, some good comments. And again, I want to thank the guests. We'll be back the second Wednesday of next month. Thanks for tuning in.